All right, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aparna Gupta, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution at Pepperdine Caruso School of Law. It's so wonderful to see so many members of the global community on this webinar. Today's event is mediating this moment, lessons from ADR in promoting understanding and advancing justice. We are joined by three distinguished mediators and experts on this topic today, Professor Singh, Daniel Weinstein, and Anne Claire Williams, who I will introduce shortly. As you all likely know or have heard, on Monday, May 25th, George Floyd, a black man, was killed by the Minneapolis police when he was detained on suspicion of a forged $20 bill. George's death follows that of Brianna Taylor, who would have been 27 years old today, who was also killed by Louisville police on March 30th. George and Brianna joined a painful and growing number of Black Americans killed by police and vigilante violence. Their, their deaths sparked a nationwide wave of peaceful protest and civil unrest. Amid the coronavirus outbreak and the health and mortality disparities along racial and economic lines that has wrought on our country, the deaths of George and Brianna served as a tipping point for many Americans whose lives were disproportionately in danger by parallel viruses of COVID-19 and of racism. Today's conversation aims to look at how we, as mediators, lawyers, students, and practitioners can use lessons from ADR to play a critical role at this time. At Strauss, we have been having these conversations for a long time, and right now, our country needs professionals with diverse skill sets who don't shy away from conflict, but who actually see it as an opportunity positive social change. Let me introduce you to our speakers. Our speakers include Professor Singh, Managing Director of the Strauss Institute. Professor Singh is an international mediator who has successfully resolved disputes across the world. His practice, teaching, and scholarship focus on cross-cultural dispute resolution, faith-based mediation, and utilizing modern theories, science, technology, to devise creative solutions to global disputes. We also have Judge Danny Weinstein, one of the nation's preeminent mediators of complex civil disputes. Judge Danny is a co-founder of JAMS, the largest ADR service provider in the world. And in 2008, he started the Weinstein JAMS International Fellowship Program to provide professionals outside the US with an opportunity to learn about ADR. And his nonprofit, the Weinstein International Foundation, further <coughs> by making mediation more accessible to global professionals. Earlier this year, Strauss honored Judge Danny with his highest honor, the Peacemaker Award, for his dedication and commitment to advancing mediation. Last, but certainly not the least, we have Judge Anne Claire Williams. Judge Williams is a trailblazer and leader, heading Jones Day's efforts in advancing the rule of law in Africa. Devoted to promoting the effective delivery of justice worldwide, particularly in Africa, she has partnered with judiciaries, attorneys, NGO, and the U.S. Department of justices and state to lead training programs in countries all over the world. She's also taught at the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia. Welcome everyone and let's get started. I will turn it over to Professor Singh. Thank you, Aparna. Uh, Ms. Gupta, uh, always wonderful to have you as our dear colleague at the Strauss Institute. Thank you, Chris Chiao, for helping us put this webinar together. Um, Judge Weinstein, Judge Williams, it's, it's an honor to be with you again, um, but especially today when we are in difficult time, we're going through a difficult, not a week, two weeks, and a lot of pain is in the air. There is emotion in the air. There is injustice. There is um, dialogue that needs to happen. There is healing that I see a possibility of happening in our society in the fabric of America. Without much ado, I will ask you a couple of questions if you are okay, judges. Um, I wanna start with you, Judge, Judge Ann uh, Williams. If you please share with me and with us, if you may, um, in your role as leader for diversity in legal profession, um, what do you think are the major struggles, obstacles that we need to overcome as a society um, and especially with any reflection on the current times with you're in. Judge Williams? Yeah, I think 
before I get to that, if you don't mind, I just wanted to share with all of you my thoughts about this situation because, you know, George Floyd couldn't breathe. He was handcuffed on the ground. The video shows the knee crushing his neck. Eight minutes, 46 seconds. I gasped in horror at the brutality, the inhumanity of someone who was supposed to serve and protect. Hand in his pocket, staring at cameras with impunity, no fear of reprisal. It, it took my breath away. I felt his pain and I was in tears and angry and outraged, but I was not surprised. Why? Because as Aparna talked about, a long, long history here in America of police brutality, officers rarely being held accountable, some never charged, acquitted by juries, the long sordid history that taints the majority of officers who honorably protect and defend. This nightmare repeating itself with Black people, I wonder here, all of you listening and those who are not Black, do you think for one moment that what happened to George Floyd, Floyd would have happened if he were white? Would any of you white on this call like to be treated the way Black people are treated in society by police officers and treated in so many ways? You mentioned uh, inequities in housing, food uh, in insecurity, uh, COVID-19. I would guess your answer is no. And because that answer is no, you recognize what at least have some sense of what it's like to be Black in America. And then I saw the reactions to the nightmare, universally condemned, cries for justice, for reform in policing, for change, not just from Black people, but what heartened me this time from white people, brown people, young people, older people from every walks of life, religious, ethnic groups across the country, some places almost entirely white protesters around the world standing together. And we saw police chiefs and policemen taking a kneel, condemning the killing and, the, and corporations. I have never received so many emails from corporations, small businesses, not-for-profits, educational institutions, foundations, law firms, athletes, celebrities, regular everyday people acknowledging that Black Lives Matter. We recognize we need systemic change, institutional systemic change, but we can only do that standing together. And I realized that this to me is a different moment in America, a recognition, I think, that people realize Black people cannot do this alone. We need you, we need all of you, we need white allies, we need allies of from every walk of life, who will stand with us, who understand the issues, who will discuss and openly discuss race, something that we kind of kept under the covers or to the back in our society. As a dear friend put it, because this is what gives me hope and gives me the hope to breathe on. Through this nightmare, we must breathe, simply breathe. Breathe because Floyd, did not get to breathe. Breathe, because as long as we're all still breathing, we can make a difference. And I believe in this moment, we can join together to make that difference, breathing together. And mediation is a way to help that breathing come out. The techniques that are used in mediation to listen, to hear what each side is saying, to figure out what the ultimate result is or the ultimate goals are and to try to craft something that makes sense. Not just in police consent decrees, but I'm talking about the everyday uh, interactions that people have because what we need in America is we need this dialogue to continue to be real and we need allies. We need allies. So that's my overall. Uh, sort of comment. Uh, and I think, you know, that if you want to turn to Danny, that's fine with me. I mean, I can go on to the major struggles, but I think it's hard. I think it's important to put that in context. Yes, ma'am. I, Judge Williams, what, what Black Lives Matter, your words are powerful. We appreciate you being here today and leading 
the nation in terms of thinking about from a judge's perspective and as a black woman, as a black judge, we, we truly care about your words. Thank you. Judge Weinstein, would you like to make an opening comments as well, if you may, please? I want to make sure Judge Weinstein can hear me. Judge Weinstein? Okay. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yes. can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I was on mute. All right. Uh, you, you asked me, I want to comment. First of all, uh, spontaneously, I just want to say what uh, an honor it is to be as closely associated in this struggle uh, with you and with Judge Williams, who really is a, a model of leadership in the efforts we have for reconciliation in this in this country. I, I was going to answer a question, but but I was so moved by what uh, Judge Williams said. Uh, let me tell you a little um, about myself in, in this regard. I, I, I was, um, I'm a little older, and, and uh, I was a part of two, two struggles in America that I thought might lead to the kind of reconciliation and uh, enlightenment that we're hoping for will come out of uh, out of these tragic circumstances over the last uh, month, and of course, what's happened. I, I, I was very much a part of the march on Washington with Martin Luther King and marching in the South and the Civil Rights Movement, um, and then very much a part of the Vietnam War struggle and all of the protests and uh, that, that that came out of that uh, um and in both times i had some hope that some of the deep rooted uh, struggles in this country and uh, and and the racism that had become a part of our system was a about that there was hope to make a, a, a major change in the way we operated and functioned. And it, and, it, and it lamentably didn't really happen. We made some progress legislatively. We've made progress in some fronts. But tragically, uh, we're aware that uh, we still have a, a long, long way to go. And and what Judge Williams said, and what I what I think we have dedicated our careers to in the world of mediation, is to see whether the techniques, the and the state of mind that people bring to mediation, and the sort of the way of approaching conflict and and issues, uh, gives us a chance this time, um, along with some other things, to, to not uh, fail again. And to fail again might be the end of the democracy as we know it, um, if we can't make those changes. So um, I, I think we, we wanted to, uh, just as an introduction, um, I, I, I think it's, yeah. it's deja vu in some way all over again um, that here's an opportunity, here's this country torn apart, our wounds are open, and will we have the mechanisms to keep and to make the changes we need to make? And that's the challenge before us. And I think when uh, we get to it, I'd, I have some ideas about how this movement in mediation and the state of mind that accompanies it makes it an opportune time for us to ensure that those changes occur systemically uh, in a way that we failed before. And that's my hope. And I think 
mediation has given us a great hope and a great tool. Judge Weinstein, thank you for your powerful words as well and for your lifetime of contribution to our, um, to our field, to people around the country and around the world. So I'll come back to saying a few words about your background in a minute. I thank you for your opening comments. Um, Judge Williams, if I may ask you to comment now on, on the struggles, what struggles do you think we as a society are facing? What obstacles there are? And as a legal mind, how do you suggest we can overcome those struggles together? Well, I think um, you've heard that expression where there's a will, there's a way. There's the will and there's the way. The way I'll talk about, because there are two levels to me. The way is changing policing in America and dealing with our, uh, 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 all the injustice and the discrimination that we know exists in this country as it affects black people, brown people, and actually others, LGBTQ. So we've got, in terms of this policing, that's one thing. Two, it's this will that Judge Danny was talking about, this cultural shift. We have to have a will. And, and, and that's what makes me excited about the fact that everyone seems to get it. I don't know if it was because it was COVID and we were all locked in, and then because we all saw the same video, even if people were going on social media and I don't know what your views are and you were seeing different things on different channels, we all saw that video. And the way on the police, I think Sherilyn Eiffel at the Legal Defense Fund and other experts have really laid out a roadmap for change. If you look at Slate Magazine, uh, uh, Slate rather, has an article. And so traditionally, we've dealt with consent decrees. And of course, there is a role for mediators in that space to mediate between the police, the unions, the mayor, the, all the stakeholders. So that's a role. And the problem, I think, with, I like the consent decrees, and some of them have been very effective, but do they have teeth and will they be enforced? That's the big question with consent decrees. And consent decrees affect policy and they affect training, because that's where the focus has been a lot on supervision and training, policies that can help pierce the blue wall of silence and cover-ups. Like recently, I was reading about a 75-year-old elderly white gentleman peacefully protesting in Buffalo. Two officers, I don't know how many of you saw this video, but you need to see it. It was a line of officers. They were coming toward him. He was just coming toward them just uh, in his gentle way, very tall guy. They basically just mowed him down. He fell down on the back of his head, clearly uh, broke his, because blood is just gushing from him. The other officers finally called for, for help. And the two officers reported that the guy slipped, that he, that he slipped and fell. And the officers around them who saw it, there's no way they couldn't have seen it, uh, never corrected those officers, never stopped those officers. And so you had two bad apples. And in this culture, the others to me became bad apples because they became complicit. And so we need to change the culture so officers can speak up, can stop the abuse, can tell the truth, which is not an easy thing, but we've got to make that something that's admirable. That's a change. Two, police officers. So what's happening? So now there's been more of a emphasis on getting uh, a, a national database. So the police officers who have been uh, fired for misconduct and brutality can be, can be, can be listed. So they don't get to go to the next department. There needs to be a decertification system that can make them ineligible to work somewhere else. Every police killing of an unarmed suspect should immediately be transferred to an independent investigator and prosecutor. Uh, there needs to be a disclosure of the restrictive laws on police misconduct. If, if this had happened instead of Minnesota, it had happened in New York, we wouldn't know about the 18 times the police officer had been accused of misconduct. We have to deal with the police unions because there are some unions that have provisions that say uh, the police don't really, the police officer doesn't really have to answer 
until 72 hours later and has access to the videotapes and everything else. So plenty of opportunity to make sure the facts are the way they want them to be. Five, we, it's critical to mayors now to look at funding in a way where if the police are engaging this kind of conduct, they can't get certain funding and also prioritize social services, youth development, mental health reentry re program. There's a provision of the Civil Rights Act, Title VI of 1964, that forbids federal funding of state and local programs and engage in racial discrimination, never used against the police department. It should be. And then there's that issue of qualified immunity that shields police officers. So those are like, to me, that's the way. Now the will is changing our culture, trying to build bridges, changing hearts and minds. And this problem of avoiding discussing race, educational systems that don't emphasize the importance of diversity and understanding different cultures. We know the racial divide in this country, in housing, in education, the schools are more segregated than ever. Go online when we're talking about changing minds and take that Harvard Implicit Association test and see where you stand on the bias scale. Or think about this. You, can you name three Black journalists you read or three Black websites you follow? Can you name three Black authors whose books have influenced you in your life and three people you've talked to about those books? And finally, can you? Think of three racist remarks that you remember hearing where you challenged it and corrected it. We have to work on the will. We have to work on the mindset. We have to, and I, and I think this moment of recognition is time, is time to look at that and to get that will. I'll, if, I'll, if you want, I'll turn it over to Danny. I have some best practices that we can talk about how you create that compassion and understanding and listening, because I think there's a lot of fear out there and a lot of suspicion and a lot of stereotypes about groups, and we have to get over that. Uh, Judge, Judge Williams, this is amazing what you're sharing with us and the, your intellect, your, your identity, you're bringing passion, you're bringing... We, we appreciate you opening up and, and being vulnerable with us and also challenging us, making us think, do, do, we, do we have biases in our mind? Or do we have implicit biases? What we can do, each one of us as individual, to come out and improve and contribute to a better future. Uh, we will come to listen about best practices. I'm eager to listen to best practices. I wanna quickly turn over to Judge Weinstein and and hear a couple of things from you. Judge Weinstein, you, you started the Weinstein International Foundation where Judge Williams and I happen, thanks to you, as uh, join you as board members. And what, what I've learned from you, I'll be honest, in the last many years, is a leader. You are fearless, you give a lot, you're very generous, and you're a fearless mediation leader, if you may, worldwide. Can you tell us in this moment what does dispute resolution teach us? How does the practice of mediation dispute resolution prepares us to be better leaders, um, to contribute to society? And, and just like Judge Williams and yourself, maybe we can pick a couple of uh, points from you and, and copy and paste to our lives. Um, um, Judge Weinstein? Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, 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 I wanna lead into what uh, my colleague, Judge Williams will be be talking about about best practices, but but we have an enormous challenge right now um, with the combination of both the the pandemic and this the the, the present crisis of that that uh, uh, we've been living through over the past uh, couple weeks. And and both both of these crises, as you, you know, I was reminded that the Chinese word for uh, crisis is the same symbol. The symbol of it in the Chinese language is the same uh, for crisis as it is for opportunity. And and this does open an opportunity for us 
um, if we can create a safe space for it to occur and the right conditions for it to occur um, for, for real change. And um, the, 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 the problem that, and, and Judge Williams will, will talk about it uh, when, when we return to her, but the, the, the question is, how do we create a safe space where we can open the doors to people um, who are frightened, people who don't understand and don't want to understand what the roots of in, invested uh, many institutions are in it um they're there and, and we don't unfortunately we have leadership which is not uh, conciliatory but a, a leader who is causing greater divisions and a uh, election and politics coming up which will exacerbate these differences and the chance that people will go further and further into their caves and not communicate. Um, let's take the police department uh, just as, as, as an example. Um, folks, I hate to tell you, we, we depend on the police in our communities. Uh, there are many, many things that the police do that are important and good and involve great sacrifice in domestic abuse and keeping order in helping in many ways. And there are many good cops out there. And we can't in the process alienate the, those Absolutely. people along with our absolute determination to root out institutional racism and the bad cops. But how do we get that kind of understanding? How do we get, how do we enlist, enlist more police and more troops and so on to kneel and to be part of this movement um, as opposed to being seen as the enemy. And mediation and the kind of format that it creates provides the laboratory to bring about that kind of understanding of very different kinds of people and folks. Unfortunately, in recent times with increased nationalism, with, with the kinds of things going on in the world and the leaders in the, in, the, in the world, so few of them being conciliatory and diplomats, uh, we, we now have this opportunity and, and Judge Williams can maybe talk about how we create in um, mediation for, and, and those many of those on on this uh, on this Zoom call understand that, for instance, Pepperdine is doing a lot of work with the with the LA Police Department in efforts to get people to understand things better and to enact practices that are more compassionate and more understanding. Um, and and that's the work that many of the young mediators and, and mediation practitioners, lawyers practicing mediation, mediators practicing mediation can help to further in the coming months. And, and I'll close by just saying this, why is mediation different? We've had, we've had people of goodwill before. We've had uh, diplomats who are decent folks who tried to solve problems. We've had some world leaders who've been very compassionate and understanding and, 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 and have failed in areas in the Middle East and in, uh, in, in many areas in the world. Um, and that's because mediation, when it's practiced well, and when the right preparation takes place, can create a safe place, we, we call it in my lingo, in the field, where, where conflict is suspended for the moment 
and people look at a problem with, with a different lens. And maybe this, the combination of this pandemic and what has happened in our country in the last week has created um, new opportunities for things to take place in the field of reconciliation. And, and that's what people like yourselves and Judge Williams and others who are expert in spotting that um, are hungering to, to, I think, to, to take advantage of this op. If we can create a safe place for people to open themselves up to these divisions and these raw edges and see if we can bring about some true understanding and reconciliation. And that's my hope. And, and, and this, new, this new group of mediators and lawyers who understand the concept and the mindset of mediation gives us a chance that we um, shouldn't regard an, an opportunity uh, where we've failed before. And so right. I'm both um, very worried, but, but, but optimistic and hopeful. Judge, Judge Weinstein, thank you for those powerful words. Now, friends who are in this talk, we may have an opportunity to ask maybe a couple of questions to both judges. So think about those questions. Give us 10 to 15 minutes and we'll go there in about 10, 12 minutes. Um, to summarize, just a couple of points. Judge Weinstein is speaking about opportunity, speaking about safe space, how mediation gives us space, space, and speedi- speaking about how we have to include policing as part of the movement and not create an enemy and not create further divisions how racism cannot be tackled by becoming a racist. It is tackled by becoming compassionate, understandable, knowledgeable person and not giving up, keep up the fight. Judge Williams, we know how much work you've done in Africa, in other countries, Africa as a continent, within Africa in many countries as well. You have, you're the best person to tell us about best practices and tell us, please guide us, shed us some light, give us some wisdom on what can we do in our individual lives and in our practitioners as mediation practitioners, dispute resolution practitioners um, to move along forward from this moment in life. Thank you. At the beginning, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of trying to do the balance between the fact that the majority of law enforcement in this country does serve and protect. And if you recall those consent decrees during the Obama administration that we worked on by Attorney General Holder and Loretta Lynch, there were listening posts. I think the Attorney General, I know Loretta Lynch did, went to 13 cities, sat down with police officers, sat down with the union, sat down with people in the neighborhood. It was, I thought, the sort of best effort we had had in terms of bringing people forward and doing mediation. The problem was they were all dropped. And the thing is, police officers were saying, police chiefs were saying, we want this reform. We need this. We need this in our department. And we're actually happy the Justice Department is here moving things forward. So I think we have models out there we need to reinvigorate those models. The part, of, part of the problem with consent decrees is that it just takes so long to negotiate it. And then you have violations of the consent decree, but that, that's just the way, it, you know, that's just the nature of it. But I think that when we talk about how we can make a difference, I really think we have to start with each individual. I think we have to each realize that we have power. There is power within us, the power of one to change. We may take little baby steps, but soon those baby steps get to be giant steps. Soon all those little ones that join together and they move the ball forward. And I think part of the problem has been, and now I was not training the police, okay? I was not training the police. But I suspect that they were not getting deep into bias, (laughs) systemic bias, and actually looking inside themselves to see where they were. I have a feeling it was a lot of lecture, talk to, talk to, talk to, not 
sort of now there's so much interactive training that's going on. I mean, I think people have to look into their hearts and I think they have to listen, listen, listen. And somebody has to convey that message. You know, we listen as mediators and you have to listen with an open heart and mind and you have to learn. So let's talk about Drew, Drew, Drew Brees. So he's asked about Colin Kaepernick and the kneeling and the protest about uh, police brutality and killing and that kind of thing. And he goes off on discussing the flag, what it means to him. He never got to the issue of police brutality. He was really criticized on it. And then he came back with this statement because he listened. And I don't know, these words to me were so powerful. I stand with the black community in the fight against systemic racial injustice and police brutality and support the creation of real policy change that will make a difference. I condemn the years of oppression that have taken place throughout black communities and that still exist today. I acknowledge that as Americans, including myself, we have not done enough to fight for that equality or truly understand the struggles and plights of the black community. I recognize that I am part of the solution and can be a leader for the black community. I will never know what it's like to be a black man in America or raise black children, but I will work every day to put myself in their shoes and to fight for what is right. I recognize I should do less talking and more listening. And when the black community is talking about their pain, we all need to listen. Did you hear what he said? In the shoes of black people, taking responsibility, acknowledging that he had to learn and that he had to listen. And he got that statement out, I would venture to say, that that statement has enormous impact. You know, there are cops that love him. You know, like the thing is, the influence, I mean, to me, Having the entertainers, the all these all these people come together, the same everybody coming together on the same tune makes a difference. Here's another one when I say use your heart and mind and listen and then listen and encourage. So we have to in, we have to encourage the police somehow and community members on the other side to unwrap the package. There's this woman named Janice Giannini who said she's a white woman. She said she'd die for her country to protect it, but she was thinking about the gravity of how far we simply haven't processed in terms of humanity and our heart and soul ached. People fear what they think is reality rather than finding the courage to check it out. They fear it. So here's a woman, she wants to adopt some kids. She adopts them from a developing country. They're not white. She and her husband, great life. Kids are great. They get to seven or eight. Suddenly, some of the kids start making fun of them because they look different. The color of their skin was not white. And she says, and I quote her, holding my nine-year-old in my arms, crying uncontrollably, wanting to go back to her country of origin where she would, quote, look like everybody else. It is heart-wrenching. There are not words to describe it, and the pain I feel today is every bit as intense as the pain I felt that light night. It will rest with me my whole life. Now, her daughter hadn't changed. The environment around her had changed dramatically. As her peers got older, being influenced by family and other cultural biases and prejudices, her life was changed. She goes on to quote, I personally have hope for humanity. Why? because I saw that transformation with my mother, who was the most prejudiced person I knew, not happy about these two kids of color, but within six to eight months, they were her grandchildren. And she was trying to figure out how to make a difference to make it better for our children and adults whose package isn't the same, because we're all packages wrapped in different colors. And she said, I need your help. I can't do it alone have coffee with somebody of a different color. People fear what they think is reality. You might think that even though the wrapping is a different color, the precious gift inside is more like you than you ever realized. And then she said, some will say I should stick to my own kind. My response is, I did stick to my own kind. I am human and I adopted humans. See, those are, the, those are the messages to me 
if we don't get to the soul, and look, I'm not a Pollyanna, so I know we're going to always have, not, I don't want to say that. I don't think we're going to always have. I know there will be people whose minds will not be changed. My hope is even if their minds don't change, their behavior change, changes because they know they will be penalized because of how they behave. That's what I want to get to. I would like to get to a world where everybody in their heart and mind changes. And I think most Americans of goodwill can get to that point, but they have to acknowledge white privilege. So go back to her little example, the children. White privilege is your children get seven or eight and life is the same. They go on, expectations are the same. Nobody calls them names. Nobody teases them or anything. When they go to the college counselor and they're thinking about going to college and say, I would like to be a lawyer, counselor says, well, that's great. Let's look at the classes you've had. Let's get a letter together. Typically, not in all cases, but I've had so many kids tell me when they have those kinds of aspirations, kids of color, both Black and Latinx and others, Asian as well, I was told, Judge, no, you should be a teacher, or no, why don't you be a truck driver? All these things, that, 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 that's white privilege. We have to acknowledge that. We have to educate ourselves. You look at, I just saw Sesame Street is doing something now on diversity. That is a fabulous thing. The National Museum of African American History and Culture has now advanced this website that is all about diversity. They have so many materials and everything. And so people have to self-educate. And I think that's very important. Our allies need to learn and they need to unlearn biased behavior. Then silence is complicit. You know, you know, we want you to talk to black people, white and black people and other colors talking either, but you know what? You need to talk to your family and friends. Okay, because the problem is not with black people. You know, we've always had to live dual existences. We've always had to survive in the black segregated communities and also in an integrated world. White people need to talk to their families, to their friends, and even if you're running into pushback, because I get the same thing sometimes with some of my fans, you know, people that I know, you stand up as a beacon for doing the right thing and saying the right thing because you have the capacity to be a leader and to change people's mind. And so make that point of reaching out to someone, someone of a different race. And then I get this question all the time. So how is that, you know, it's just sort of, I don't know what to say. You go down to the basics. So uh, where did you go to high school? Uh, do you have pets? What sports teams do you like? I mean, like it sounds like trivia, little tiny questions, but you know what? Those are the same questions you ask people of your same group. Don't be fearful. And those then lead to understanding. So I think about, I became chair of court administration and case management of the Judicial Conference of the United States. And I had judges from all over the country, about 15 judges represented from every circuit, some from small towns, some courts of appeals. I was the first person of color to chair that committee, first, uh, first woman to chair that committee. I made it a point at every committee meeting, I had to sit at the head of the table, but whenever we had our dinners and lunches, I moved from one judge to another. There were no other black judges on that committee, but I knew that in order for me to be effective and to be an effective leader, I had to find out about them. And that's how I started those conversations. So I really want to focus. I know, Judge Danny, we need to focus on the bigger, how do we bring people together? But I think it starts within ourselves. And I think that is something people have been afraid to talk about until now. And so I think getting involved in with organizations that support justice, voting projects, homeless shelters, food banks, because it doesn't mean that we have to just mediate the police department. These organizations, these not-for-profits are gonna need help. Some of the businesses have been destroyed. They're gonna need help when they negotiate with the landlord. They're gonna need help when they deal with their vendors, support black businesses. Student, get involved in those students on the line, get involved with student organizations, sign petitions, contact government leaders, and please, please vote, not just in the national election, but in the state elections 
and the local elections because you know guess what it's coming out now now people like get it oh the prosecutor is elected by the people oh 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 my goodness that initial prosecutor that should have been charged they should have been arrested that day but surely the next day anybody that's been a prosecutor and i have you you file a compl you file a complaint you you have probable cause you charge them with what you know everybody knew was aiding and abetting at the very least even if you didn't have an autopsy and you knew you could charge him with uh, at least third degree murder you charge him then you do the rest of the investigation that's the normal course of things but look what happened when the prosecutor changed got busy he got those charges i personally feel that if we had had those charges that day or the next day there would have been there would have still been protests but we would not have had the level of protest i think right. we would not have had the amount of looting that we had uh, or not i wouldn't even call it looting i would say theft because the other thing is we have to put that in context it seems that there's some extremists that were at work here and there were people with other agendas but there was some opportunism but you have to think about the people who live in food deserts who don't have any money who have been unemployed who no prospect of a job so who am i to judge what i don't want is that to overshadow the real cause and the real uh, uh, uh the, the real mission of justice and i would say as we reach out this janice gianni i love what she said at the end if you're uncomfortable doing this Please think about it and pray for courage. Courage, it really isn't that scary. We are all just people. And remember to breathe, just breathe. Breathe like George Floyd couldn't breathe. And I believe as long as we breathe together, we can make a difference. So I really do think the fundamental, we have to really look inward. And I don't think Judge Danny, there's been a lot of that kind of work done because you know, I, and I also think this other work should be going on. We definitely should be doing all these other things. But I think it, when everybody saw what really happened, there was no way you could get out of it. He was on, he had handcuffs. He was not resistant. Everybody was like, this is not my America. I don't want to live in a place like this where people treat citizens like this. This is not my America. And I think we, I just think that's a fundamental thing that we need to do. We need to look inside ourselves and say, is our mindset the way it should be to be a mediator? And do I have biases? Are there things I need to get? Are there things I need to do to make myself the kind of person that would be able to handle these conflicts, which I see, again, popping up in a whole lot of areas, and that's just not with the police. Judge Williams. Thank you so much. Um, you taught us mediators that each one of us has power. You taught us that we need to work on our own biases. You taught us how to listen and talk less, use heart and mind, and how some people fear reality and they run away from it. And I, I just can't repeat how much you said that makes so much sense to improve also as a neutral, also as an impartial, mediator in our society, which we need more as leaders in this current times. And I so appreciate your thoughts on silence and your thoughts on changing our own perspectives. Truly appreciate. And everybody, you may not realize, but Judge Williams was is training today. She's also on the board uh, and a member of uh, National Institute of Trial Advocacy. She's, she was training today attorneys and judges, and she took time out to be with us. So I truly appreciate your time here, Judge. Judge Danny Weinstein, we have, how about, we have four to five minutes before I will give at least one or two chances to our dear colleagues. We have amazing alumni here. We have some faculty members from Pepperdine Crusoe Law, staff members, and of course we have the LLM students who are doing a special residency today here as well. So Judge Danny Weinstein, any closing remarks, any thoughts you have to follow up on Judge Ann Williams, please. Uh, um, to, to follow that um, and, and with us, I, I, I'm just like I think the rest of the audience sitting and absorbing the message from uh, Judge Williams, who has just who has lived this as a as a black woman, as a great jurist, as a citizen of the country in a way that someone like myself just can't 
duplicate. So um, I'm, I'm humbled by that. I, I, I took two, two lessons for us media. I, I returned to mediation because that's what sort of the, the common uh, thing that brings us uh, together. Um, one, uh, in, in different words, she said what, what we often say, which is the better person you are the more conscious you are, the more enlightened you are, the more you're aware of your own limitations, mm -hmm. your own biases, and your own prejudice, the better mediator you make. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't mean that, that people can't go in and in some cases do the, what do you want to pay? What do you want to do this? And, and bring about a reconciliation of some sort, but but in most conflicts, uh, your own sense of yourself, understanding your own biases, understanding where you're coming from, um, recognizing your own limitations and how you come off to old folks, women, black folks, whatever it is, and how. Um, your background and so on affects the dynamic in the room. The better you'll be at what our our purpose is, which is to bring about movements and 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 to to reduce conflict. So that it, she said, get out there right now and involve yourself and learn as much about your own involvement in this. Uh, in in racism and in in our and and what's going on in our country, and do it in whatever way is is the best and most accessible to you. But do it. And and then I think the second thing that I heard say that was important to me is we quote mediators or mediation advocates have a duty to to help create the safe spaces and the, 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 the conditions in which effective dialogue and understanding can take place. But, but I heard her say, before you try to do that, that check yourself where you're coming from and you have a better understanding of your role and your, uh, and, and your participation in it. And then, in the ways that you can do it. And I think the opportunities, I'm, I, I'm both frightened by what's happening and I'm excited by what's happening because I see an opportunity that since the March on Washington, I haven't felt before. I haven't felt since. And um, I hope I'm around long enough to, to with, with all of you to, to work about making real change in this, uh, country and using the tools that we all are learning in mediation and with these great uh, uh, examples of, from Suk Simran and, and Judge Williams of, of moving forward with it. So I'm, I'm, uh, th that was a great lesson and, and uh, thank you, Judge Williams and Suk Simran with your observations for letting me participate in this. This was a great treat. Thank you. Judge Weinstein, many people aspire and, and want to do things. You are the one who does things like Judge Williams. So we appreciate your presence with us. And in India, we touch feet of wise men and women. And right now, we feel like touching both of your feet. That's my feeling right now. Is, uh, there is so much wisdom, courage, hope, intelligence, knowledge, humbleness. What you both have demonstrated to me, I mean, I feel like crying. This is so powerful. If we were just listening, all of us, this can change us as human beings. And I just truly thank you both for your time, for your wisdom. Judge Williams, you are, you are an amazing role model. We, let's, let's duplicate you. <laughs> and I need, we need more of you. And, and please be the guiding force as you are to all of us. And please keep talking. I'm so glad you took a break today and talked to us. We may have folks time for one question, if you'll forgive me. Maybe if somebody has an... Um, question that you want to ask. Otherwise, I want to end on time. We have three minutes left. If you raise your hand, yeah, I will 
wait for a minute. If, if not, then I will move towards conclusion. And I want... Jaffe had a question. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. I'm unmuting you. Jaffe. Go on, please ask. Yeah, please. You have to unmute yourself because I can't do it here. Thank you. Yes. I appreciate everything um, that uh, Judge Weinstein and Judge Williams said. Um, Judge Williams, I, I so very appreciate all of the points that you've made. Um, and uh, I'm currently right now um, uh, working on a, a paper and a collaboration with some other black scholars here in Chicago on the origins of police brutality and racism. So this, this talk and these points that you've made have, have been very, very illuminating and I wanna thank you. Thank you, wonderful comments. And thank you for doing the important contribution that we all need to do in one way or the other. Appreciate it. Any, um, Oh, Judge Williams, you're speaking. I need to unmute you once. Yes, please. So uh, we are, so you should, you should definitely contact me because one of the things I've now been put on the committee at the firm, there are three of us that are trying to decide right now how we, we can have, make real systemic change and have huge impact. And we're going to put the resources of the firm on that. Uh, just as we did uh, in Laredo in 2014 when all the women were separated from their children and everything, and we did a permanent project on Laredo that is an ongoing thing. So we're doing, we now have a social justice uh, uh, initiative. And so uh, we, and we also have a policing initiative and they may, I don't know where everything is right now, but I know we have the policing initiative and I'd be interested in um, engaging you because part of what's happening is what's going on in Minnesota, but part of it is trying to look at modeling and all that kind of stuff. So I appreciate that. Um, I, if it's okay with you, I'll get your information from Professor Singh. Um, but as a, a law scholar, um, uh, I've been uh, collaborating with a lot of groups, American Constitution Society, some mm -hmm. of the other things, uh, to uh, start to think about some very specific objectives to uh, addressing the problems, um, both here in Chicago and nationwide as it, as it comes to uh, uh, policing standards. So um, absolutely, thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, Judge Williams and Judge Weinstein, we have some amazing comments that you may not have had a chance to read, but I will send you a copy of them. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Arona. Thank you, Priscilla. Mm -hmm. I can go on and on. Deshaun, Craig, Karen, Linda, Priscilla, uh, Tom, Emily. Um, thank you all for writing. These are such wonderful comments. And thank you to our faculty who took part as well today. I know you're hiding, but you're there. And thank you for listening. We have to bring change. We're learning from the pillars of integrity, compassion, and wiseness, and those two pillars were here with us today. Can we all just uh, unmute ourselves for uh, 30 seconds and just join me in thanking the judges for their time. Unmute yourself and, and thank the judges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We salute you judges. Thank you for doing what you're doing. We know you are busy. You need to get back to your lives. Uh, everyone, we need to conclude right now. Thank you for your presence. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Appreciate Thank your time. You. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you for Thank having you. me. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, we just going back through the